We got a couple of great responses to the video on whale evolution. If you haven't seen the original or the responses, links are in the description. They make a lot of claims that we got some things wrong, but let's look more closely and see if that's the case. First up, we pointed out that a temporal paradox existed with Pachycetus and Endohias. The response was that, these aren't a linear series, the temporal paradox isn't real, because the species last longer than individual animals. They would have overlapped in time. Yes, this is technically true, but also a little bit misleading. I know they're not claimed to be direct descendants, rare is the scientist who would be so bold as to make such a claim. Coyne says so much in his book, Endohias was not the ancestor of whales, but it was almost certainly its cousin. I'm merely following Coyne's argument. He's motivated to paint the evidence in the best possible light, the book is called Why Evolution is True for Crying Out Loud, and I use the dates that he provides. On the one hand, he'll admit this, but out of the other side of his mouth, he also asserts that they're chronologically ordered and tries to paint them as a sequence, starting with Endohias, then Pachycetus, and so on. Like I said in the original video, it seems like he's trying to pad the numbers. Someone not paying attention would get the impression that the evidence is more substantial than it really is. It's fine if you want to soften the claim, however, if you do, the argument loses its force. Next they say, the nested hierarchy of shared derived characters allows scientists to put the fossils in order. It's believed that they shared a common ancestor because they both have a similar inner ear bone, as well as some minor tooth features and bone density. This hardly seems to be a slam dunk though, the authors in the same paper acknowledge Characters identified as synapomorphies for cetacea in some of our most parsimonious trees include, and they list some characters, and then they say, all of these characters are found in some mammals unrelated to cetaceans. They don't in fact demonstrate common ancestry at all, rather they assume it and work back from there. This is a widely acknowledged starting presupposition about the data, not a conclusion from it. I may do a video on systematics in the future, but that is a much longer discussion. Next, they take issue with my statement that Darwinists ignore where fossils actually show up and place them wherever makes Darwinian sense. Nothing about the chronology, they say, contradicts the evolutionary relationship of the two species, and they say that apparently I know where Endohias is supposed to be. But Coyne himself says that the sequence begins with Endohias. It is less whale-like than Pachycetus. It should be first, but this isn't what the evidence shows. The expectation is that the cetaceans would begin as more terrestrial and less aquatic, and over time, they would become more aquatic and less terrestrial. The evidence of these two species does not support that conclusion. The evidence is explained away via ghost lineages. Coyne ignores where Endohias actually shows up and places it at the beginning of the sequence, where it makes more Darwinian sense. Exactly what I said. Next, this one is funny, they say that I'm making the, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys mistake. If Pachycetus came from Endohias, then why do we find Endohias at the same time as Pachycetus? No, more accurately it would be, if whale evolution is supposed to be great evidence because of this chronologically ordered series of fossils, then if the fossils are not, in fact, ordered chronologically, then is it still great evidence? I think that's a pretty fair question. Next, let's look at the Bacillosaurid fossil find. Now this one is important, he claimed that I used an outdated source from popular media rather than the more careful paper. He says that more recent analysis of the strata the fossil came from suggests that it's between 40 and 46 million years old rather than 49 million years old so that the timeline for whale evolution isn't really altered at all. It's true that the Buono paper points out multiple possible dates for the fossil, and the researchers conclude that they preferred the youngest possible date range of 46 to 40 million years ago instead of the much older 49 million years ago initially reported. Let's look at their data and ask why they might have preferred the youngest possible dates. From their paper, they list multiple different studies. For the sake of argument, we're just going to take all of their numbers and methods for granted. Various geological dating methods are used and give ranges of possible dates. The more of these that we can put together, the better idea we can get of the supposed timeline. They first list a very broad Dutton study that has a wide range of about 55 to 46 million years ago, which is constrained further to 54 to 48.8 million years ago by the studies of Ivany and colleagues, Wren and Hart, Kokoza and Clark, as well as Harwood. Yet more studies, Douglas and Beale, support a range of Middle Eocene, specifically the early Middle Eocene boundary, according to Beale and colleagues. The data converges on the same number as originally reported in the date I used in my original video, 49 million years ago. In any normal situation, the preference in paleontology for reliable dates is to use the absolute dating over biostratigraphic dating anyway. However, the absolute dating is so unfavorable that they prefer to ignore the absolute dates and use a portion of the less reliable biostratigraphy dates that agree with their presupposition. 
And more recent studies than even those listed in the Bono paper confirm that the overwhelming number of studies using multiple lines of evidence, radiometric strontium dating, magnetostratigraphy, and biostratigraphy of different index fossil groups support the older date originally reported of 49 million years ago. The problem with where these studies converge is that it's far too early in a Darwinian model. Fully aquatic whales should not have lived that early. They chose the dates of 40 to 46 million years ago, not necessarily because that is where the data converge, it isn't but because, as they say, it is more consistent with a published stratigraphic record of bacillosaurids elsewhere. In other words, their conclusions are being skewed by evolutionary presuppositions. This fossil still casts a huge shadow over the entire timeline, their overly optimistic conclusions notwithstanding. Next, let's take a look at Archaeopteryx. They say I've got a bad quote there. In the original it says, the small ciliosaurian dinosaurs related to Archaeopteryx. And I have that in brackets theropods. Okay, is this a bad quote? Are the small ciliosaurian dinosaurs related to Archaeopteryx theropods? Yes, they are. They're a subgroup. There's nothing wrong with the quote or how I used it. Okay, well, what about the more recent fossil finds that Jackson brings up? The paper he cites notably confirms the long-known temporal paradox with bird evolution. Yet, Archaeopteryx was still trumpeted for years previously in spite of this known difficulty. The shiny, one-sided story is presented to the public, and the legitimate controversy is hidden. That is, until they think they've solved it. Back to the point, the authors list a handful of fossils and say that these discoveries provide significant new information on avian origins. What Jackson doesn't disclose is that this is a highly controversial statement in paleontology. Avian evolution is fraught with phylogenetic uncertainty. It's a can of worms. Some authors consider these to be as bird-like or more bird-like than Archaeopteryx, while others consider the same taxa as less bird-like than even the Troodontidae and Deinonychosauridae. It is still a mess. Maybe I'll make a more in-depth video on it later, but the temporal paradox problems with bird evolution are hardly solved. Okay, what about Tiktaalik? They say that Tiktaalik was not dethroned as a transitional fossil because it was never considered a direct ancestor of tetrapods, even before these trackways were discovered. All the footprints showed was that the tetrapods or fishapods diverged much earlier than was previously evident. It's great that the initial paper was cautious in its claims for Tiktaalik and that scientists are willing to update things as more data comes in. This is what science is supposed to do, but it seems like Jackson is unaware of how Tiktaalik was presented and the importance placed on it by other prominent scientists. For just one example, Tiktaalik was such a huge deal precisely because it was supposed to be a prediction, when and where it was found stratigraphically, that was marvelously fulfilled in a stunning vindication of the evolutionary theory's predictive power, the most tangible evidence that evolution is true. It could have actually been a direct link in a true transitional form, and that it actually might have been your distant ancestor. One of the greatest fulfilled predictions of evolutionary biology. It was not only anticipated but predicted to occur in rocks of a certain age and in a certain place. Marvelous. But as it turns out, this is a failed prediction. As Luskin observes, when a widely touted prediction of evolution falls apart, evolutionists often rewrite history, soften the prediction, and claim that the harder prediction was never made in the first place. They often use slippery definition of terms to push their theory harder than the evidence allows, and then fall back to weaker arguments when the data contradicts their prediction. They also attack those who talk about the failure of this prediction as being ignorant of the true claims of evolution. This is known as moving the goalposts. Finally, let's look at the Durrett and Schmidt calculations. PZ claims that Michael Behe is a very bad mathematician. It's true that the Durrett and Schmidt paper was aimed at showing that Behe was wrong. I'm really glad that this was brought up. Yes, the Durrett and Schmidt paper attempted to disprove a model presented in Behe and Snoke's previous work. But ironically, they ended up strongly reconfirming the central thesis. The standard math of population genetics establishes the implausibility of Darwinian mechanism to produce what it needs to produce with the time and population resources that are available to it. Behe himself had to write a rebuttal in which he stated that the Durrett and Schmidt paper was, quote, seriously flawed, unquote. So it's seriously flawed when it annoys Michael Behe, but the discovery institute is happy to gloss over that part to cherry pick conclusions they like from this seriously flawed paper. No, data was not cherry picked. Their entire conclusion, as mistaken as it was, was granted. Behe called it seriously flawed because it contained serious flaws. Durrett and Schmidt themselves acknowledged as much in their reply to Behe. 
First, correcting for a simple oversight of using the incorrect mutation rate, then correcting for their neutral rather than deleterious model, because again, the empirical data suggests the intermediate mutations are not neutral or harmless and adjusting for the effective rate of the second mutation and their inappropriate multiplication of probabilistic resources, their calculations were off by more than seven orders of magnitude. When correcting for these errors and others, their model agrees quite well with the original paper by Behe and Snoke, as well as the empirical public health data and the literature. Next, they accuse Dirt and Schmidt of calculating the waiting time far too narrowly. They don't model how evolution actually works, because humans and fruit flies have lots of places in the genome where beneficial mutations can take place, which increases the odds substantially and shortens the waiting time as a result. But no, in fact, Dirt and Schmidt are right in how they modeled it. This is the proper way to estimate the power of Darwin's mechanism, because almost all possible single or double or triple mutations amongst sequence space will be useless. It would be silly to think that just any two mutations in general would be adaptive. The vast majority are completely ineffective or degradative. This is why they chose to model it so specifically. So this is not like a specific individual winning the lottery. That's a gross misunderstanding of the model. For a more full treatment on this, see the notes below. And finally, 2005 paper that purports to shred Behe and Snoke's calculations. This one is pretty simple. The authors wrote a reply answering Lynch's paper, and in it, Behe and Snoke write, Our model posited necessary intermediate mutations to be deleterious in the unduplicated gene. Lynch's model assumes them to be neutral. All of his objections to our work stem from this difference. Experimental studies contradict Lynch's assumption of complete neutrality as a rule. The majority of amino acid substitutions decrease protein function. They go on to explain other incorrect things with Lynch's paper, but that's the gist of it. So much for shredding their calculations. That's basically it. There were other minor objections that Jackson and PZ cover, but these are their main objections. As I wrap up, I just want to say thank you to them for engaging in the discussion. I know it takes a lot of time and effort to create videos like this, and this sort of open discussion lets people see for themselves the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. That's it. Thanks for watching.